This video is part of a series on the XV6 operating system kernel. In this video, I'm going to talk about processes, and in particular, the data structure that is used to represent a process. I'll talk about how the array of PROC structures is initialized and how we set up uh, the data for the initial first process. This stuff comes from the file proc.c, which also contains a bunch of other stuff. So in addition to this material that I'll be talking about, uh, it also contains the code for the scheduler, for yield, and so on, as well as the code for the sleep and wake up functions. I've covered these things in previous videos. The file also contains code for functions like fork and wait and kill, and I'll cover those in a future video. So let's begin with um, the file itself. And um, I want to start with these two fields. Uh, there's a process ID counter that's initialized to one, and there's a spin lock called PID lock. So right off the bat, we can take a look at this function uh, alloc PID. So whenever we need a new process ID, we can call this function, and it's pretty straightforward. It returns the new process ID. And in order to access, to read and update the next PID global variable, we need to acquire the lock first. So this acquires the lock, and then it reads the current value into a local variable, and increments the global variable, and then releases the lock. So this is pretty straightforward use of acquire and release. Okay, now that that's out of the way, we can uh, go into the uh, first function that I want to cover, which is proc init. Before I do that, let me remind you of the structures that uh, are relevant uh, for this video. Uh, we've got uh, an array of proc structures. So here I show one of them. And we have 64 of them in total, one for each process. And remember that they have a spin lock and some fields, such as the state, whether it's running or runnable or so on. Uh, channel, if it's sleeping. Uh, Boolean for whether the process has been killed. Uh, and some other things. Uh, we've also got a pointer to the area in virtual memory where the uh, stack is located. So uh, I'll come to that in a second. Um, the size of the address space, that is uh, the break point for where the top of the heap is for this particular process. Pointer to the page table, a pointer to the trap frame, a context for saving it, and a few other things, uh, such as the name field. Um, so uh, I'm not going to go over that just now, but uh, I do want to talk about this function proc init which initializes the proc array. And this is called once uh, by core zero only uh, during the initialization of the kernel. And it initializes that lock for the process ID that we just saw. And uh, it also initializes another lock um, called wait PID, sorry, uh, wait lock. And then um, it goes through this proc array Okay, so it's going through the proc array, and for each one of them, it initializes uh, the spin lock. Okay, so it goes through, oops, it goes through this array, and for each one, it initializes the spin lock, and uh, it also initializes uh, this k stack. Okay, so at this point, I'll talk about what the virtual address space looks like for the kernel. Remember that the kernel's virtual address space, like all address spaces, will have a trampoline page mapped into the uppermost page. And then it has a series of guard pages and stack pages. So for each of the 64 processes, there is one page in the virtual address space for the stack that will be used when that process is running in kernel mode. So uh, at uh, this point here uh, in the proc init function, we are determining the virtual address. This is a preprocessor macro function. Given a number between 0 and 63, it uh, determines the virtual address for that stack page. And it simply saves it 
in the k-stack field of this PROC structure. So here's the PROC structure again. Here's the k-stack field, and it just says the virtual address. And I, I added this dashed line to indicate this is a virtual address, uh, as opposed to these links here. Uh, the page table points to a physical address somewhere, somewhere in physical memory, as well as uh, and the trap frame pointer, which points to the actual physical address of the trap frame. The trap frame, of course, will be mapped into the second highest page of the virtual address space, but this pointer right here is to the actual physical page that was returned from kalloc. We'll see that happening in a second. Uh, there are a couple of other functions in this that I've already mentioned, but I'll just uh, review them. CPU ID returns the number of the core that's currently executing this function by just returning the value of the TP register. The MyCPU uh, uses that current core number and returns a pointer to the CPU struct. Okay, so here is the array of CPU structs, and here I'm showing one. There are up to eight cores, uh, that's a fixed constant, and each one of them uh, has a CPU structure. And uh, uh, so we're uh, returning a pointer to the one for the current core. And uh, finally, we have the myproc uh, routine, which uh, gets the pointer to the current CPU struct and then follows the proc field to get a pointer to the structure that represents the procedure that's currently executing. Okay, each CPU struct each CPU struct has a PROC field that points to a PROC structure. Each core at any one point in time is either executing the scheduler code or it's executing one of the processes. If it's executing a process, then this pointer is valid. It points to a PROC struct. If the CPU is executing a, the scheduler code, then this will be null. Okay, so those uh, functions are uh, pretty straightforward. Next, let's take a look at um, proc dump. I think proc dump is um, simple. Uh, basically, this is for debugging, and it's just going to go through the proc array and print it out, print out information. So um, it, it's past nothing and it returns nothing. And what does it do? Well, as I said, it's a for loop that goes through the entire array of all 64 proc structures here. And um, if that st struct is unused, okay, in other words, if the state here is unused, then we just don't print out anything. Uh, so we continue and repeat the loop body. Um, otherwise, we look up the state in the array that we have here. We have a little array that... Uh, maps the constants unused, sleeping, runnable, running, and zombie into short strings. And so we grab the string here and called state. And we're here we're just checking to make sure it's a valid, uh, a valid number. Otherwise, we use that. And then we print a single line. So this is going to print a line for the uh, process with the process ID, its current state, and the name. Okay. The name field is a, a fixed uh, length uh, uh, field, and we can store a short name I, uh, in that field. And so here we, we print the name. Okay, so that's uh, pretty straightforward. That's proc dump. Now we're going to get into the alloc uh, function. Um, so let's look at what this function does. Okay, first of all, it's past nothing. When we need a, a procedure, when we need a proc struct uh, to uh, create a new process, we call alloc proc, and it's going to find one and initialize it and return a pointer to it. Okay, look in the process table for an unused proc, if found, initialize it and return with a lock held. Okay, and if there's a problem, it returns null. So here's what it's going to do. This is an outline of what it uh, does, what the code does. It uh, first searches for an unused proc structure. Then it calls kalloc to allocate a trap frame page for that process. Then it creates a new page table, adding mappings 
for the trampoline page, which of course is shared by all virtual address spaces, and a mapping for the trap frame page that just got allocated. And then it sets up a the context, or maybe I should say it initializes the context in preparation for the uh, first time slice of this process. Recall that in the uh, proc structure, we have this context area, and this is the register save area. So we uh, do some initialization there. And uh, the address space that got created, we, you know, we created a page table here, but we didn't put anything in it. So there's no code or data yet. Uh, alloc proc, this alloc proc function is not responsible for that, but uh, it'll be added later. Um, and if there are any problems, this function has to undo everything, return all allocated pages back to the free pool by calling kfree, and then it returns no. Okay, so let's take a look at the code here. Um, here we are looking for a proc structure that has a status or state of unused. So we're just looping in this for loop through the entire array of all 64 elements. And for each, we acquire the lock. If it's uh, unused, then we have found something. Uh, another go-to here, to this label down here. Uh, but if uh, it's in use, then we release the lock and keep looking. Okay, and if we can't find anything, we return our null. Okay, let's say we find something. Well, that's good. Uh, so here we fill in the process ID. Each process will get a new identifier. Um, no telling what happens when this uh, variable rolls over. We don't worry about that sort of thing in XV6 because it's not going to ever happen in our lifetime. And uh, we set the state to used. So that's uh, one of the states that we uh, can have in the... Um... Well, I just remember that uh, the used state is not listed here. Okay. Um, well, in any case, uh, it goes into this uh, state of being used, and uh, uh, will uh, the caller of this will be responsible for making it running, or sorry, runnable at some future time. Okay, so then we allocate the trap frame page. So here we're calling kalloc, and if anything goes wrong, well, we're going to release the lock and return null, and we're also going to call this free proc function. I'm going to cover that one next, but basically it just it's called anytime there's a problem. We see it being called down here as well. It's basically going to uh, make the proc structure unused again and zero out all the fields so that it could be recycled. Okay, so uh, now we create the page table. So uh, here we call a proc page table, and I'll cover that uh, in a moment here, but that's going to uh, create the page table and um, uh, add a couple mappings. But uh, if that's all okay, then we keep going, but otherwise we uh, call this free proc to undo what we've done, release the lock, and return null, just as we did up here. Alloc proc is called in two places. One is user init to create the first process, the init process, and the other place is the fork function, which is used for the fork system call. And in any case, what's going to happen after the process is created is it's going to be scheduled to be run. So um, we need to kind of set things up for that. So remember that in the proc uh, structure, we have the save area for the registers. This would be the uh, registers that the kernel, uh, the, the, the process is going to use when it starts running. And of course, it will start running when it gets scheduled in kernel mode. So you've got the registers uh, that will be uh, used um, or restored, I should say, and the RA and SP registers, the return address and the stack pointer. Okay, so this is a new process. Um, it's not uh, getting rescheduled. It's getting scheduled for the first time. So we need to have a return address and a stack pointer for its initial scheduling. So we set the context. Well, first of all, we, we clear out all the registers. So memset just uh, writes a zero to all of the registers in the register save area. And then we initialize 
the RA register to point to this fork ret function. I'll look at that in just one second. And we initialize the SP register to point to the stack page. So uh, remember that um, each process has a page in virtual memory. And for example, process two has this page at this address in virtual memory. And stacks grow downward, so we want to initialize the stack pointer to point to the top of this so that it can begin to go downward from this zone. So we initialize the stack pointer. So when this process is scheduled, that is when it has its first time slice, it will begin executing at the address given here, forkret, with a stack. What we're going to do after we call alloc proc is basically fill in the code and the data, and we also need to release the lock. Remember that we have acquired a lock up here. We need to release the lock, and then this thread can go on and do whatever it wants to do. But at some point, the uh, scheduler will select this process, and it will uh, acquire the lock and it will uh, for that process, and it will schedule it. And then it will uh, load the registers from the context and that will include the return address. And so this process will begin, every process, including the init process, will begin uh, by executing the fork ret function. So here's the fork ret function, and uh, we can see what it does. Um, it, well, remember when we first get scheduled, we are holding the process lock, so we have to release that lock. And uh, we have nothing more to do except the, um, return from the trap. Well, we haven't really had a trap, but we begin by returning from the trap. In the case of a fork, we have had the trap. In the case of the initial process, we are going to fake the trap, uh, but in any case, we do a trap return here. Uh, this other, the other stuff in forkret, you can see that you've got a global variable first, or a static variable, I should say, that's initialized to true. So this will be done one time. The first uh, time that any process is scheduled, uh, it will execute this code, then set first to false. And it says the file system initialization must be run in the context of a regular process because it calls sleep, and thus it cannot be run from the main function. So that's what's going on here when we are just about to schedule the initial process, we will uh, see that first is one, and we will invoke this file system init function and take care of that before we do the user trap ret to the um, first byte of the initial process. Okay, next let's take a look at um, free proc. So if anything goes wrong, uh, and we'll call free proc. And when we're done with a process, we'll also call free proc. So what's it going to do? Um, well, it's passed a pointer to the procedure that you know we're abandoning, and it looks at the trap frame pointer. Okay, it looks at the trap frame pointer. Uh, oops, here we go. And it asks if it's not null, then it points to something. So return that to the free pool. So that happens here and sets the trap frame to null. And then it looks at the page table pointer, okay? It looks at uh, this uh, pointer here to the page table, and it needs to um, basically destroy that page table. And so we'll uh, discuss uh, page table and uh, proc page table um, and proc free page table in a second here. But basically it's gonna uh, call proc free page table to undo that page table and return everything to the free pool. And then it uh, zeroes out uh, uh, some of the remaining fields. Um, you know, it, 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 this is not strictly necessary, but it, it does all of this. It's a null in the name field and uh, so on. Uh, but in, most important, it sets the state to unused. So at this point, uh, this uh, process is, uh, the proc structure is unused. Okay, so in uh, alloc proc, so returning to the function alloc proc, uh, we found a proc structure 
and um, set up the trap frame. And then we call proc page table, okay, to create an empty user page table. So now let's look at proc page table. So create a huge page, a user page table for a given process. So it's passed a pointer to the proc structure, and um, it's going to uh, set up the page table and return a pointer to that page table. Uh, and I, as we saw in, in alloc proc, it'll just store that in the page table field. Okay, so what does it do? Well, we've covered UVM create to create an empty page table. Okay, so that just uh, sort of creates the user page table. And if there's any problem, we return zero. Uh, next, we map, we create a mapping for the trampoline page. Okay, so the trampoline address, this is the address of the highest page in the virtual address space. It's one page in length. And we map it to the trampoline page. This is the page in the kernel's code area, marking it read and executable. And so we've discussed map pages. So that adds a mapping to the page table for the trampoline page. And if there is a problem with that, then we uh, free the page table that we've created um, and just return. Okay, next we map the trap frame to the page, the second highest page, and um, we uh, call map pages again. Uh, the trap frame address is the second highest page. Again, it's one page in length. And where is that page? Well, we've allocated a page by calling kalloc earlier and set trap frame to point to the physical page in physical memory. And so uh, that's what we're using right here, the trap frame. And we're making it readable and writable. And if there is any problem, well, we unmap the trampoline page and then again, free the page table and return zero. Okay. <clears throat> now what about uh, the converse, the free proc free page table? Uh, well, We've discussed these functions in the videos uh, on the virtual memory functions. Uh, so we basically remove the mapping for the trampoline page without freeing the data page itself. And we remove the mapping for the trap frame page without freeing the trap frame page itself. And then we um, call UVM free to completely obliterate uh, the uh, page table to return all the data pages to the free pool and to return all the index pages to the page to the free pool. So where we call um, where we call this is in free proc. So here's our function free proc and you see we we're already freeing the trap frame page here so that's why we don't uh, uh, ask for it to be freed at this point right here uh, because we've already freed it. Um, and we call a free page table here and uh, set page table to null. So this is where we use proc free page table. Okay, now let's uh, talk about the um, this function here, which is user init. User init is called to set up the first user process. So uh, let's walk through the code. It's not too long. So uh, the first thing it does is it calls alloc proc to find a proc structure and uh, sort of set it up. So now we've got a pointer to the proc structure. And this is called the init proc. So we're going to save a pointer to that. Um, next, we're going to allocate a single page and copy in the code for the initial uh, process. So uh, here we are calling UVM init, which we've discussed uh, earlier, but it's passed a pointer to the page table. Okay, so alloc proc would have set up this page table, but not filled in any code or data. And UVM init has passed a pointer to some bytes and the number of bytes, the count, uh, and what is that? Well, this is a knit code right here. Okay, this is this array, 
and it contains the bytes, and uh, I think they counted out 52 of these things. Um, you can check me on that. Let's, uh, 8 times 6, 48, 49, 52, 52, 52 page, uh, bytes. So here we are um, going to, whoops, going to copy in those 52 bytes into page 0 of the uh, virtual address space that is being pointed to by this page table. We're also going to set up the size field. That's one of the fields in the proc structure and right here. This tells uh, how big the, uh, the uh, virtual address space is from zero to uh, the break point. And here we just have a single page, so that's not very much. Okay, prepare for the very first return from the kernel to the user. Here's the trap frame. The EPC was where we saved the program counter. Uh, when a trap occurs in a running user process, we save the program counter, and we save it here. We save all the registers as well. Okay? We save uh, all the general purpose registers, including the stack pointer. Okay? And so when we get ready to return to the user's process, we return to executing at this program counter here, after restoring all the registers. So what we're doing here is we are setting the program counter to zero. So for, the, for this process, and only for this process, we'll start executing at location zero. For all other processes, when they first begin executing, well, they were created as a result of a fork instruction, and they will begin executing directly after the, the fork, uh, call to the fork system call. And so uh, we don't need to do that for the other processes, but for the first process, the init process, we set its uh, program counter to zero, and we also set its uh, stack pointer to the page size. Okay, we're gonna remember that the initial process will have exactly one page, which will contain both the code and the stack. So by setting SP to the page size, we are setting it to the top of that initial page, and so hopefully the initial process won't grow its stack very much. In fact, it won't grow it at all, but uh, we do set it up anyway. And then finally, we copy into the name field of the proc structure. So here's the proc structure again, and we have this name field down here. It's a fixed number of bytes, a small number of bytes. Um, and we are copying in these characters uh, save string copy is uh, something that will copy a string from one place to another place uh, and it won't overrun the target area. So we're passing in the maximum number of characters to copy with this size of parameter here. So that way we don't uh, over, accidentally overrun this uh, array here. And we've got a couple of other fields. Uh, the current working directory down here of the proc structure is initialized. Uh, to point to um, this, this uh, a slash, so that's what that is. And then finally, we set the state, whoops, let's set the state to runnable and release the lock. Remember, alloc proc uh, returns with the lock set. And so now we've uh, allocated a, uh, a function, uh, sorry, allocated a proc structure and changed its, uh, initialized its page table and everything, got it all ready to go. We set its state to runnable, and we're done with it. We can ignore it from here on out. Uh, this, this thread that's running this can ignore it. And so we just release the lock, and the scheduler will then find this process when it's looking for something to run, and it will see that it's runnable, and it will just schedule it. And the initial code will then start executing. And of course, what it does is not much. Um, uh, just looking up to this code here. Uh, here's the code. Uh, of course, you can't read this because it's the machine code for the RISC-V processor. But in any case, what it does is calls, uh, performs a system call for the exec system call, passing it a string of slash init, and that's all it does. And um, we are basically uh, getting this code. This is the Unix command, octodump. Uh, basically, we're... Um, octo dumping it and putting it into a file and then copying it into here. So there you have it. And I'll uh, cover the rest of this uh, file, the proc.c file in a future video.